Next up is Dr. Nigel Ashford, who's speaking on how to change the world. Uh, Dr. Nigel Ashford is Senior Programs Officer at the Institute for Humane Studies. He joined IHS from the United Kingdom, where he was Professor of Politics and John Monet Scholar at the European Integration at Staffordshire University. Over to you, Nigel. So my goal in this session is to get you to think and to discuss about how do we create a free world. The speakers have presented a very optimistic and exciting vision about what the world would be like in the future if freedom is allowed to flourish. But there are many people who do not want to have a world based on freedom. As Steve Davis mentioned yesterday, Mike Munger this morning, there are many people who are opposed to that vision of a free society. They want to prohibit, they want to regulate, they want to tax. So how can we ensure that the future is the free world that we, at least I hope everyone in this room, wants to achieve? So the way I want to address this is, first of all, I want to present two very different views about how the world get changed. Is it the power of ideas, or is it the power of interests? And then, rather than the regular question and answer, although I'm happy to take any, what I think would be more productive is to throw it out to you and say, what do you think? is the way to achieve a free society in the world? What is your contribution to achieving that freedom? And one possible way, you don't have to do that, but one possible way of answering that question is if I gave you 10 million pounds a year, and I want to be absolutely clear, I am not going to give you 10 million pounds a year, but if, theoretically, I gave you 10 million pounds a year to promote liberty, the most effective means you could think of doing so, what would that be? So I said in the Q&A session, I wanted more of a discussion of people throwing out ideas about uh, this question. So let me begin by one view of the world, of how do you change the world, and it comes from Friedrich Hayek, and it's about the power of ideas. He wrote a, a famous essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism. And I want to give a crude version of his argument. So first of all, he defines what he means by intellectuals. He uses the term the second-hand dealers in ideas. And he gives a series of examples. Professors, journalists, authors, teachers, church ministers, artists, and that ever so useful word, etc. So you might want to think, what would you add to that list of intellectuals? And also note that he very much saw people who are full time engaged in ideas. Now we live in a totally different world of communication. Is it now for many people to be part time intellectuals? Are you part time intellectuals? Now, in Hayek, makes a very sharp distinction between what he calls scholars, people of original ideas, and I suspect he put himself in that category, and intellectuals who take these ideas and then spread them to others. So the first thing you might want to think about is, who are intellectuals in the modern world? Secondly, Hayek believed that most intellectuals were statists or socialists, to use his language. And the reason he believed that is this. First of all, they look at the world and they see bad things. They see poverty, they see discrimination. These intellectuals believe they know how to create a world where these bad things no longer existed. And if only they had the power and resources, they would create a world where these bad things no longer existed. That's why, and we may have, all, all of us may have had that experience at some time, when a friend proposes or supports a new policy or a new law, 
and we disagree with it and we oppose that policy and we oppose that law, their reaction is, well, the only reason you're against this is you're a selfish bastard. You don't care about the poor. If you cared about the poor, you'd be in favor of the living wage. The fact that you're against, it shows what an unpleasant person you are. Now, Hayek is very sympathetic to the first claim that there are lots of bad things in the world, but he's deeply critical of the second claim, that we know how to resolve all these problems. Intellectually, he's associated with the whole discussion about the limits of our knowledge. And because he doesn't think that giving the resources to these intellectuals would lead to the positive consequences they believe, is why he's strongly giving them against giving them so much power. Thirdly, he believes that intellectuals are extremely important in political change. He has a model, a chain of causation of how does policy get change. You start with the scholars, they influence the intellectuals, the intellectuals then spread these ideas to public opinion, and public opinion determines what the policy makers believe. So in this view of how to change the world, scholars and intellectuals are very important. Do you think he's right? Or do you think scholars and intellectuals like to believe that they are important? Fourthly, he thought that people generally agree on the, the ends they want to achieve. We want a world without poverty. The real, the disagreement is not about ends, but about means. We disagree about what sort of society would be one that would reduce poverty the most. So his vision of how to change the world is to present ideas, to try and reach the intellectuals, to write books and articles and organize conferences and change the minds of the intellectuals. This is a vision that my institute, the Institute of Humane Studies, supports. That is why what we try to do is identify young people who care about individual liberty and assist them to become intellectuals, to multiply the ideas of liberty. But we might be wrong. Because there's an addition, a, 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 a conflicting vision about how you change the world. This is, it's all about interests. And this we'd associate with another Nobel Prize winner, James Buchanan, and the so-called public choice school. So they begin with the assumption that the pursuit of self-interest is the primary, not the exclusively, but the primary explanation of people's behavior. If you want to understand why people do what they do, you have to understand their perception of their own self-interest. Now, in very much policy discussion, there is an assumption that those engaged in the private sector are pursuing their own self-interest, usually measured in terms of income and wealth. Yet, when we look at what government does, very often there's this perception that people in the political realm, they are driven by a concept of the common good, the national interest. The public choice will say, well, wait a minute. People in government are human beings too. They are also motivated by self-interest. The difference is, they argue, is that very often people engaged in the private sector are motivated more by economic material reasons, although I would argue there's a hell of a lot more to understanding that than simply material. They argue what we, that people in the political realm are also driven by their own self-interest, but it may or may not necessarily be material and nature. So if we want to understand what determines policy, they argue, we need to look at what is the interests of people engaged in the political realm. 
So let me give you a classic example because it's one of my pet peeves. The common agricultural policy. Nearly all the experts agree that the common agricultural policy is a really bad idea and should be scrapped. Here we have a policy which is very good for about 7% of the population of the European Union. They gain the financial advantages of the existence of this policy. What about the 93% not engaged in agriculture? Well, it means that they, probably most people in this room, when they go to the grocery store, they pay more for their groceries and they pay higher taxes to support this policy. In other words, the vast majority of people, they're getting screwed at both ends. Now, we live in a democracy. Here is a policy which is good for 7% and bad for 93%. Well, obviously, in a democracy, that policy would disappear, would be abolished. And yet every time there's an attempt to do that, every time you think we've tried to solve it, instead it comes back, you go, get, get, get. <laughs> and then it comes back up again. So how do we explain that? Well, the public choice say we explain that because the 7% who benefit from this policy, they really, really care about it because their income and wealth is tied up with this policy. So they vote for candidates who support the policy. They campaign for candidates who support this policy. They throw cow manure over candidates who don't support this policy. What about the 93%? Well, we don't think about agricultural policy very much. But even if we did, for each one of us, we're probably talking about three pounds a week extra. Is that going to go, encourage us to go out in the streets of London and bring London to a halt so that we abolish CAP? It doesn't happen. And so CAP is an example of a more general phenomenon that public choice have identified, the problem of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. That is, the policies uh, often benefit a small group, but they really care about it because the benefit's in their hands. But the vast majority of people, the costs of these policies are very widely dispersed, so nobody who loses out really cares about it. So the public choice school argues that this is true of most policy making. It's not driven by ideas. It's not driven by democratic majorities. It's driven by strong, powerful interest groups. So if this is true, what's the solution? Well, they make a number of suggestions. I'll just mention two. One is, can we organize pro-freedom interest groups? For example, like the Taxpayers Alliance, who was represented here. Or can we organize people in favor of free trade? And secondly, they're very interested in, in finding what they would call political entrepreneurs, political leaders, that can organize a coalition in favor of freedom. And they often refer to Margaret Thatcher as an example of that. So two groups of intellectuals, both of whom believe in liberty, but have very different visions about how to change the world in favor of liberty. Now, I want to throw that out to you. And I'll, I said I'm happy to take questions, but I would prefer for you to say, what do you think is the most effective way of changing the world for liberty? What, do you, what are you thinking about doing to contribute to a free world? And if you want to, if I gave you this 10 million very, 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 very mythical pounds to change the world for liberty, what would be the most effective way of spending that money? Thank you for listening. <laughs>